How's it going everybody? Jason here. Welcome back to the channel and thank you so much for watching. Hope you're staying safe wherever it is you are in the world. So up here in Canada, things are starting to open up a bit. So maybe even next week I can head out to a patio and have a drink, which would be awesome because the weather's nice and all the snow has finally melted from way up here in the Great White North. So uh, I did get my first vaccine, which is awesome. And other than this weird van following me around and the fact I seem to be really, really good with numbers now, not a whole lot is different, but political nonsense aside, let's get into it. So I'm gonna do a live uh, one year, almost one year anniversary review of the Softube console one. So I got this, so I think end of June last year, maybe mid June, and I've been using it more or less exclusively for the last year. So I'm gonna talk about how it's changed my approach to recording music at home, how it's changed my workflow, and I'll sprinkle in answers from a few viewer comments along the way. And then I'm going to take a look at the drive and the drive character features of the console one, because I did mention them in my full review of it, but I really didn't go into the depth of what they do and what's possible with it. So first, let's look at workflow. So I would say um, workflow wise and approach to recording, it's simplified everything for me. Most importantly, because of the decision paralysis I used to go through by having so many different options for plugins. Should I use the Softube stuff? Should I use the default Logic stuff? Should I use the Omni Channel or the Waves Q10, Q6, Q8, Q4, or the VEQ3, the VEQ4? Should I use the Pultec clone and Logic? And just having too many plugins, which I think I made the mistake that uh, a, a lot of folks do when they're new is I thought plugins were the problem, which obviously now where I'm at today, that that's not correct. But by committing to the ecosystem and having a variety of soft tube plugins that I can load into this thing has simplified my workflow and it, fo it helps me focus on making better decisions for the song and for the mix and for songwriting and for engineering. And I don't have to worry about this because I've played around with it enough. I've saved enough presets. I've actually taken presets from other plugins and replicated them in the console one. Now, obviously that's not gonna make it sound exactly the same because the plugins are going to be a little bit different, but I would at least take uh, all the transient EQ and compressor settings that I had set up in all the different plugins I've been using for a while and save them as presets here. So at least I get the kind of the benefit of a good starting place. So as far as how it's affected the recording, um, I, I guess the, the one of the big mistakes that I used to make was the approach to recording was get it good enough and whatever is not good enough, I can fix it in the mix, which obviously sounds pretty stupid um, today. But back then I thought, well, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. Software is kind of magical, I can fix it, which, um, going back and listening to some old mixes from a couple of years ago, I'm just like, oh geez, I can't believe I actually released this thing. So now I focus on um, good engineering. Um, and then because of the way that I've set up my default project here and all of my presets, once I've got everything recorded, I've got an 85% ready song right off the bat just by doing some leveling. So really I only use these two plugins. I use the NLS channel, which is an analog saturator, so it simulates three different types of consoles, and then obviously the console one. And then here, I also will use input processing. So the Focusrite I have, it's not like the Apollo products or the Apogee, I think the desktop Symphony, and some of the more expensive audio interfaces that have a DSP and um, input processing. So basically, you know, if you're using an Apollo Twin, you can record vocals, you can run it through a lower high pass filter or a compressor or another plugin and print it right on the track. My Focusrite doesn't have that, so my projects are basically running all the plugins live, which for my machine, it's a 27 MacBook. It's not that big of a deal, but there are times when this thing just sounds like a jet engine and it is impossible to make decisions when I'm sitting here and all I hear is fan noise. So it's allowed me to, uh, the input processing, have the option of imprinting a higher low pass filter or some gentle compression into the track and then I don't have to run extra plugins on the tracks. So obviously if I do that, then I just go down to these tracks down here and I remove the bus processor from it. So I, I won't have to do that. The next is the auxiliary buses. So I have the console one loaded on my electric guitar bus. So 
usually all of my electric guitars. Sometimes I'll have two buses, so all of my electric rhythm guitars will go to this uh, electric guitar bus. All of my lead guitars or little noodle parts will go to their own bus. My rhythm section, so bass and drums, will go here and then everything will eventually roll into my music bus. And this just allows me to get multi-stage compression, uh, or I guess the term I, I, I heard from this is bus mastering, where you're, you're, getting, you're trying to master on all of these different auxiliary buses, not just on your, uh, your stereo out. And I thought, yeah, what the heck, I'll give that a try. And it seems to work well for my workflow. So I can dump all that stuff there. The other thing is by having this music bus, um, I'll use Waves Vocal Rider and I'll put that on my vocal track, obviously, and then sidechain it to my music auxiliary channel and then that helps the vocals sit in the mix instead of on it or under it. So it's most importantly by committing to the console one, I have decided that it, um, the plugins and the presets I have are good enough. The style of music I do is pop, rock, acoustic-y. Um, all real instrument, live instrument stuff. I don't use VSTs. Maybe I'll use a MIDI piano, but I'm not really doing anything else that needs like any type of extra production. So I'm trying to get it to sound like a band in a room, basically. And all of the presets and plugins that I've got here work really, really well for me. And then if there's an edge case or an outlier case and I wanna run something else, it's not that big of a deal. So mostly I've got everything set up and good to go right from the start. Last thing about workflow is it's really helped me mix with my ears and not my eyes because I've been using it long enough that um, you know I can pretty much do it blindfolded. Sometimes I might have to look down to select a different track uh, or just remember, okay, did I hit the attack button or the ratio button by accident? What was that? But I can do my individual tweaks uh, pretty easily with my eyes closed, which is awesome. And that leads me to one of the comments, uh, actually a few of these I've had is, the deal breaker for some people is that there isn't deep integration with their DAW. And most of the comments on my channel have been around uh, Logic, so it doesn't have deep integration, so that's, that's a no-no for me. Uh, Logic, it does not have the ability to adjust the fader, the panning, or your auxiliary sends. So I think if you're using Reaper or uh, Studio One, um, and I think Ableton Live as well, you can actually use the uh, auxiliary sends and some of those other features. But for me, the way that that's changed my workflow, because I don't have a transport controller, which was another comment from, from another user, um, the, um, sorry, another viewer, uh, I get the mix balanced 95% there, and then I use the input gain and the output volume to do subtle, subtle minor tweaks. It's the benefit of doing this live, right? So I'm sure I'll get ripped a new one down below for, hey, you stuttered there and you didn't cut it out. Um, obviously you don't want to use input gain and output volume of the console one to do drastic changes because it will change the tone of um, whatever you're running through it. But for subtle tweaks, it works really well. So again, not having a transport controller, I can do 99% of what I need to do to go from 85% to 100% done just with touching the console one. Um, and it saves me a lot of stress, saves me hunting around in the DAW because I've got pretty much everything in the DAW set up and ready to go right away. And I can just do the minor tweaks here, which is pretty cool. So one of the comments I had, like I mentioned earlier, was do you get an analog sound just by putting the plugin on the track like you would with you know running it through a regular console? And the answer is no, but you can use the drive uh, character and the drive select to be able to do that. So the, the drive and the drive character options here are designed to simulate uh, an analog console. So according to um, Softube, if you have the drive character set in the middle, so you can see it being adjusted there, uh, it will mimic an SSL 4000E console. And then the drive just adjusts the level of the actual drive. Now the cool thing with this is now once you start to rotate the character knob to the right, it only saturates higher frequencies. And you'll hear that once I do that quick demo here. And then if you rotate it counterclockwise, it acts more like glue. So basically the way to use this character is 
If you're going to rotate it counterclockwise, you get better results if it's on a bus. So if it's on a drum bus, for example, or your master bus or an instrument bus or something, it will act as glue and soften um, those uh, the, the overall sound of it. And then on individual instruments, the character uh, going from uh, clockwise will you know, if you've got it cranked all the way, it's really going to drive the higher frequencies and distort them. So now I'm going to put this in the middle. And uh, it's better if you have headphones on, so if you, so you'll hear the subtle differences. And they also, when I'm adjusting the drive, it's probably going to get pretty loud, so I'll keep it pretty low. I'm not going to balance the volume um, because I just want to show you what the range of awesomeness you can do with this uh, character. Okay, so I'll start with this clean guitar. I'm going to leave the character in the center position, so emulating the default SSL uh, console, and then I'll adjust the drive all the way. So this is with it off. crank the drive and then slowly dial it back. So you can hear how much it saturates once you really crank it all the way clockwise. So now I'm going to rotate, I'm going to leave it uh, in the center position for the drive level and I'll slowly start rotating the character to distort some of those higher frequencies. So it's a pretty wide range as far as what you can do with saturation, which is pretty awesome. But you'll notice it's not uh, linear. It's more. It seems more exponential. So you know, once you've got the drive character three quarters, when you push past that three quarters, that's really when you get the heavy distortion. So with this particular track, I haven't decided if I want to keep this as a clean guitar or if I want a little bit of stank on it. But I might not even use, uh, I might not even run it through an amp sim. I might leave it as a DI signal and just use the console drive to get a little bit of grit on it. All right, so I've got, I recorded this with my Strike Pro Kit. So I've got my Strike drums here, and that is going to um, a track stack in Logic, which is like a summing bus. I've got my NLS bus console plugin, and again, my console one. And console one, everything is totally zeroed out. But let's hear what this does to just a dry uh, drum track when you're rotating the character knob far left, which is supposed to kind of glue things together and um, give it a uh, softer sound, soften some of the edges. So let's listen to it with the drive off and the character right in the middle first. All right, so now I'm going to crank this character to the left and slowly introduce it.
So counterclockwise makes it sound a little bit darker, makes it sound a little more compact and glued together, and then again going full clockwise, it starts to distort those higher frequencies. So you can just see the range of what is capable with that. So when I mentioned around just using these two plugins for pretty much all of my stuff, if I go back to that clean guitar and now I introduce the NLS channel, which is like a console em emulator, and if I open up the console one again, put these things side by side. So right now the clean guitar, let's put the drive to zero, let's put the drive character uh, back in the middle, and let's leave the drive off. So now let's listen to the clean guitar and then I can mess around with both of these. So the last thing I'll show you as far as what the drive character in drive can do uh, specifically on an instrument or on your master bus. Uh, the song's not done, the parts are all recorded, but nothing, everything is totally flat. I haven't done any mixing whatsoever. So no compression, no EQ, no other processing. It's just raw recording with uh, the THU amp sims on all of the guitars. So drums recorded using the Strike Pro. Uh, bass, my Epiphone bass, all the guitars are my Oh, not that one, the PRS guitar, and uh, that is about it. So let's listen to it uh, just raw as is. So now I'll turn the console one on and mess around with the character. So obviously, then, the, other than the drastic differences in volume, you can hear how counterclockwise makes it sound darker, makes it sound smoother, a little more compact, and then obviously the further you rotate that to the right, the more it's going to just distort and oversaturate stuff. So you can do some pretty cool stuff with that. All right, so maybe a couple of nitpicks, and again, these are really, really nitpicky things. Uh, one problem that I did have with this was with the on-screen display. So there was one project I was working on that uh, I had my drum tracks done, I had the console one loaded, I had everything set up the way that I wanted. And I remember coming back a few days later, I usually will give myself a few days to put the mix aside and go do something else and come back to it and listen to it with fresh ears. And I come back and I'm like, yeah, you know, I really want to tweak that mid tom a little bit. And I opened up the on-screen display and it was blank. So the sound was the same, but there was nothing on screen. And I was like, ooh, okay. So adjusted one of the knobs, boom. All the settings from the previous one were lost and I had to start over again. That only happened a few times on one project. I haven't been able to reproduce it. So that 
uh, if that continues to happen, that is a complete deal breaker. So what I ended up doing is now, whenever I make any changes to some of my default presets, I will resave that preset song name instrument just in case, but it hasn't happened again. Hopefully it won't ever happen again because that was a total bummer. Um, I guess the other nitpicky thing is the buttons are loud. Like, I don't know if you're picking that up on the camera, but I'm just switching between the, the different, I'm pressing all of the little white buttons. And, and that's super, super nitpicky. But when you're kind of turning the EQ compressor on or off and switching to tracks and you've got that just annoying click sound, it just gets an irritating after a while, but that's totally uh, a nitpicky thing. Um, other than that, I honestly don't have any complaints about this thing. I would absolutely buy one again. I've actually been thinking about getting the fader port, uh, sorry, not the fader port, the fader one, um, to be able to, to have transport control and stuff like that as well, because it really has simplified my workflow a lot. All right, final bit on viewer comments. I would guess some of my other videos that I did for the console one, I did some videos to uh, basically explain to people if they're gonna buy a used console one, here's what to look out for. And then I made what I thought were a couple of funny videos, just making fun of how dumb their ecosystem is, but uh, uh, some of all y'all didn't really appreciate that very much. So um, the the, it was a minority of comments, but a couple people were like, ah, oh, you're an idiot, every piece of hardware works that way. So to those folks, you're half right. I am an idiot, but no, not every piece of hardware works that way. If you buy a used uh, Antelope or Universal Audio interface, that ship with free plugins, so you can do your input processing. If you buy a used one, you can go get them for free on their website, no big deal. Now, if somebody bought those devices and they bought the premium plugin packs, no, they're obviously not going to give you those premium plugins for free. You have to buy those again. And in the case of the Antelope stuff, I, I'm pretty sure their plugins are not transferable anyway, but at least you can buy a used device, get the free plugins, and use the device with its full capabilities. Not the case with this. If for whatever reason you can't get a license transfer from the previous owner, you have to buy something from SoftTube. So in my case, it actually would have cost me an extra 100 bucks, close to 150 bucks, just to use this used device compared to buying a new one, which was kind of dumb because I already owned like 400 bucks worth of plugins of SoftTube stuff. So I would have had to buy, uh, I think it was 199 US was the cheapest plugin that I could buy, and then they would deliver the free console one plugin. Now the reason is because they chose to embed the SSL plugin inside of the console one uh, interface plugin. If they would have just used like a basic EQ compressor or whatever, that wouldn't really be a big deal because you can at least buy a used device, activate it and use it. If you don't get that, it's bricked. So. You know, in my case, I bought it from a store. It was a demo, so the store had to go back to console or sorry, SoftTube, and actually pay for another SSL license and then give me that license, uh, which was really cool for the store to do. So they probably uh, lost a little bit of money on that. Um, also, uh, the transfer fee for iLock you would have to pay. Now, I can't imagine this would ever happen, but again, the reason why I made the video was to let people know that there might be something else they have to do just to get this thing to work. Because no, no other piece of hardware that I know of um, works that way, and if it does, they tell you. That's the issue. If you buy, for example, the Slate Raven, their website says if you buy a used one, you gotta pay us 99 bucks to activate it and get the software. Awesome, I know what I'm in for. Nothing on SoftTube's website about buying a used device. The Antelope and the uh, Universal Audio stuff on their websites, they have, if you're buying a used one, they have articles about that, about how to activate it and things like that. SoftTube doesn't give you any of that stuff. So it's not a case of, you idiot, you didn't research enough. There's no research on there to tell you. And yes, most pieces of hardware makes you have to activate stuff, but very few, if any, force you to get their free interface plugin just to be able to use the device in the first place. Obviously the Slate Raven is different, but that's like a $10,000 device, which I think it's a $10,000 device, but either way, um, if you're buying that, that big expensive thing, like paying an extra hundred bucks is no big deal. But for me, getting a good deal on this and having to pay another 200 US just to be able to use it, no es bueno. So. 
I hope you enjoyed this longer than I wanted it to be review. Odds are you're not sticking around, but if you are, you know, claps and props to you for sticking around this long. Drop any comments you have about the console one below. Have a wonderful rest of your day, night, middle of the morning, whenever or wherever you are in the world. That didn't make a lot of sense, but I'll shut up now. See you on the next one.